Welcome back, everybody, to the Little Less Fear podcast. Today, I would like to introduce Nicole Kerr. She's an award-winning health expert, a disabled Air Force veteran, and near-death experience survivor. She has seen what awaits you at the end of this life because she's been there, and she can certainly assure you it's a new beginning, more beautiful than you can now comprehend. A good death begins today, and with it, a great life. Through Nicole's death experience, you can learn how to live your life to the fullest. You can engage in your own metamorphosis without having to die like Nicole did. Welcome, Nicole, to A Little Less Fear podcast. Oh, thank you so much. I am delighted, excited, and very grateful to be here on the show with you today. And I'm very grateful to have you here as well. Thank you so much for being here. This is an amazing life that you've lived. And I'd like to know, and I'm sure listeners want to know, tell us about your journey. How did it all begin or what brought you to where you're at today? Well, where I'm at today. It's such a loaded question. <laughs> We're ready for it. Well, yeah, I'm sitting in New Bern, North Carolina, um, and I've wow. had a lot happen in the last 58 years of my life. But my near-death experience happened when I was 19 years old, and I grew up in the South, Bible Belt, Jackson, Mississippi, okay? So um, religion is one of the fundamental foundations in growing up in the South, and I had Southern Baptist and Lutheran, so very indoctrinated into those religions, which comes into play later in my life, so that's why I wanted to, to let you guys know that. Um, I grew up going to private uh, parochial schools until the seventh grade and then went to public schools, which were um, a real shock because I was in the opposite in terms of uh, segregation and busing. So I was one bus that was put into an all black school. So uh, that was a very different experience for me and the people in my neighborhood that were going to public schools. So um, when I graduated from high school, my dad was a former um, graduate of the United States Air Force Academy, and there, uh, I have three siblings, and I'm the second out of four, and he wanted one of us to go to the academy. Of course, don't most parents want one of their kids to follow in their footsteps at yeah. legacy at their college or whatever? So um, in 1976, most people may not remember the uh, Congress admitted women to the service academies. The first class graduated in 1980 and my class was 1986. So you can see I was kind of in that first grouping of women to go through the academy. Yeah, wow. Um, the only reason I did it was to please my father. I wanted his love, I wanted his approval, I wanted his attention and I wanted to be his girl, his boy, so to speak, even though I had two brothers. So, um, I signed up for it, went through all the tests to get through it. It's a really um, uh, very, uh, what do I want to say, hard process. You have to go through a lot of steps, plus get a congressional nomination. And um, when I arrived up there, uh, I knew within three weeks of boot camp that I was in the wrong place, that this is not what my soul wanted. And this is what my mind wanted in order to please my father. And we got one phone call home at uh, three minutes it lasted and I cried the entire three minutes when I heard my mother's voice and oh. that was my first panic attack and I did not know that then but I was hyperventilating and what I needed to hear from them was or from my mother at least was Nicole if this is not the right place for you you can quit you can, you're not a failure. You can quit and you can come home. You don't have to put up with whatever they're doing to you up there. Okay. And then later she told me, you know, I looked over at your father and I said, what have we done to her? And he said, oh, she'll be fine. Well, I wasn't fine. Okay. I was yeah. not in the physical conditioning. I took ballet. Okay. Not, I didn't play varsity sports. I was a model. I did all these things that didn't have to do with the military at all. And the military's mission is to protect and defend. And I respect and honor that, but you're taught to kill. Okay. And no soul yeah. is, uh, is prepared or is that their journey. And you can see all the people that have fought in wars, their souls have been fragmented. They have flown yes. away because they have experienced so much, um, death, uh, killing or being killed or, or being wounded and your soul in order to protect itself will fragment. And um, so I knew it then, but I just couldn't quit. I just could not deal with the shame of quitting. So I went through the whole first year, 
made it through, started my second year. And that's when uh, the car crash I was in happened. I was at the beginning of the year, I got a, a ride back with a fellow cadet who was a senior from an event. There had been drinking happening at the event. Um, now, my dad's rules were no drinking, no smoking, and no dating upper cadets. So I got a ride back with this guy, was the last cadet there, and he was the last senior with a car. So um, he wanted to stop and get a couple more beers. And I was like, okay, I'll have some fun here. Cause I'd never been on a date prior to going to the Academy. And here mm -hmm. the Academy is 4,000 guys. Okay. And I oh have never been on a date. <laughs> wow. So I'm thinking, oh, this will be fun, but we just have to be back by 7:35, or we'll get in trouble. So then we have the beers. The bartender did say, are you okay to drive? He said, yes, we were in a Corvette convertible and oh. 1965 and we never made it back to the academy and this if your audience can see it is oh the my car. goodness nicole it's completely totaled yes it is uh that's the passenger side and it's unsurvivable if you look Pri at that picture. prior to getting into the vehicle did you have any premonitions did you have any type of feelings that something might happen or did you just you just you were just kind of just let's go for it well what i didn't remember until last May when I talked to my roommate who quit the academy that December. The accident happened in August. Mm -hmm. I had not talked to her for 38 years. She did come to the oh, hospital right. and visit with me. But when we talked and I had two other um, girlfriends who were roommates there as well, we all four got together because they didn't know what happened to her either. She quit the academy because she felt guilty because she I had asked her for a ride back to the academy. We had agreed we'd ride back together. And then when the time came, there was another guy who was drunk, who was a senior that she really liked and wanted to be alone with. So I said to her, I'm ready you know, to go back. Can I catch a ride with you? Cause you're gonna drive him home. I mean, back to the academy. And uh, she said, no, Nicole, I really wanna be alone with him. Wow. And she said, but there's a guy over there um, and why don't you just catch a ride back with him and we'll see you at the academy. I said, but he's been drinking. And she said, well, Nicole, they've all been drinking. And I said, yeah, but sure, I'm not, I'm not so sure about this. And she said, go have some fun and I'll see you back. Mm -hmm. And she never saw me back. And so she couldn't deal with the guilt of refusing me a ride. And I never remembered that part prior. So mm -hmm. there was a part of me that knew he'd been drinking, that knew it was risky to get in the car with him. But I wanted to be like, go with the flow, be cool. She wants to make out with this guy. Okay, clearly be alone with him. I don't know this guy, but what's the harm in going with him? You know, well, there was a lot of harm because he was double the limit with alcohol. And um, when my memory came back 19 years later, I realized it was about him making a sexual pass at me and me saying no. And so um, he got really angry at me. So unconsciously, I had developed a connection between needing to please men or they would get angry at me and potentially hurt me. So every guy I dated after that, I was all about pleasing them. Mm -hmm. And I found friends, girlfriends, I, I please them. I don't want them to get angry with me. So it was about uh, an unconscious belief system that if I say no to somebody and they want something that I'll get hurt, I'll be harmed. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't be vulnerable again. Mm -hmm. So that's the part of me that when you said, did a part of me know about it? Yeah. But I totally wiped out that memory. I mean, I had wiped out the whole memory, but she never asked me or never said anything for 38 years. Wow. She assumed that I knew that. She never, wow. and that's the thing about communication. And when you have exactly. traumas and one person's thinking one way and another, I mean, she gave up her whole career in the Air Force and she loved it because she said, it still haunts me today to think that's what I did. You know, I, if I would have just given you the ride back, Nicole, everything in our lives, both of our lives would have been different. But I said, well, no. What happened to the, the gentleman that was driving? Did he? Um, he, uh, he wound up getting uh, some scratches. I think he broke uh, his one side of his, his hip, but he was only in the hospital for a week and his dad was a three-star general. 
called the, the head of the Air Force Academy, the general there and said, I don't care what happens, my son is gonna graduate. And this is the power of the rank in the military is they can cover up these kind of things. And any other cadet would have been kicked out. Um, vehicular, the state of Colorado did charge him with vehicular assault and drunk driving and he pleaded guilty, but that did not happen until May and he graduated the end of May. And so he, you know, um, he really didn't have to pay what I thought were the consequences of his actions. Take us back. Um, take us back to the day of your of your accident. Um, I mean, you're saying that it took 19 years. It, what's interesting is you were 19 when this happened, and, it, and then it took you 19 years to get your yeah. memory back. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's, uh, it's a little it's a little. Uh, I guess unbelievable. It's, uh, it, it is. I'm, I'm wondering <laughs> what I'm wondering if the number 19 has some significance in your life with that with that said. And um, what did you so in between these 19 years where you didn't remember anything? OK, take us back. I'm just trying to picture everything. What happened? So you you had this near death experience. How long were you dead for? Do you remember what you hit? Do you remember how you hit? Were lights out right away? What do you remember? Okay, the only thing I did remember was bright white lights. And if you know anything about near-death experiences, Raymond Moody, who coined the term near-death experience, said that is the most common experience for near-death experiencers is this bright white light. Um, it's a clear light. So it's not like a blinding light of um, like a photograph or deer in the headlights with that coming at you. You can see through it. So... I remembered white lights, but I couldn't distinguish if that was from the operating room or if that was truly something beyond me. And when I asked my surgeon years later, she said, no, Nicole, you came in, you were totally unconscious. You were thought to have been dead and you, you didn't wake up till the next day. So I will tell you, no, it was not the operating room lights. It was whatever near-death experience whatever those things are, she said, uh, that's what you had. So I pieced all this together through my, my EMT who came to my hospital room 10 weeks after the accident, medical records, the district attorney reports, and then my, my memory coming back 19 years later when I was working at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, and I was at Starbucks going about a normal day and got my usual coffee and got in my car. And all of a sudden, clear as a bell, I could see myself sitting in the passenger seat of the Corvette. And I had one foot on the uh, dashboard and the other foot crossed over. And mm. that told me right then and there, I always wondered how I basically amputated my left foot I cut up all the fourth degree lacerations insides of my thigh, my vagina, my rectum, and, and sphincter, all of that got cut up. Oof. Huge hole out of the right thigh that they had to skin graft together. Broke my pelvis on both sides because I went butt up through the windshield, uh, severed my wrist, and uh, had a horrible road burn from skidding on the gravel pavement. So they had to to slice off a couple layers of uh, skin to get that worked on. So goodness. when I wrote about it uh, in the book, my, my um, book called You Are Deathless, I just want to read it because when my memory came back, uh, I didn't go to back to work. I went to see my chiropractor who was also a body worker and he helped me through acupressure points and his body work to bring the memory up. And I was there with him. I felt safe with him. And this is what I remember. I am spinning around insanely fast, like those tilt-a-whirl carnival rides, grabbing the side of the car door. I scream as my side of the car smashes head on into something. What is it? I realize I can't stop anything and my voice fades. I fly out of my seat through the windshield. Around me, glass is shattering like splatter paint. I feel pieces of it cutting into my thighs and legs. God, this hurts. And then something slices my left foot. Bad. I try to shield my face with my hand, my mouth wide open under it. Then I'm in the air, 
for what feels like forever. When I finally hit the ground, I understand that I am going to die. My mind freezes. I scream, oh my God, help me. Then I have one final thought. I'm not going to make it. And I didn't. I, my soul, my energy body released and my soul flew out of my body when I got stuck up in the air. And that is when I called it in the book, Casper the Ghost. Um, it was male, but now I know it was my grandfather as an angel coming down and getting my soul and taking me up. So I never hit the ground. We hit a huge boulder. My side of the car did. And then it flipped the car over, landing on its top. We didn't have seat belts. We were both thrown out which turned out to save our lives. Um, but I was, this is out in Colorado. Um, there wasn't a lot around there at the time that we were at a park. Uh, there was a house that heard it. They came out, took a look at me, couldn't get any vitals. We went in, got a blanket, called 911. So it took the EMT estimated, it was a volunteer um, fire department around that area, 10 to 15 minutes to get there. So I was covered up that entire time. So for 10 to 15 minutes, he had no pulse. That's right. Wow. So That's when he time. got, yeah. So when he got to me, he uncovered me and said that he checks all of his victims himself and he couldn't get any vitals either. So he did what they call a sternal knuckle rub. I don't know if you're familiar with that or your audience is, but they, it's, it's, uh, it's to elicit pain and they do it right up your spine and uh, I mean, your sternum. And when he did that, my right eye flickered and my pupil dilated. And at that moment, my soul, which had gone to the other side, flew back in through that eye. And what do we say about eyes in the soul? Yeah, you know that they're phrase? the windows to the yeah, the windows to the soul. Your eyes are the windows to the soul. Yes. That's so incredible. That's, that's how it flew back in. And at that moment, he was able to get a blood pressure of 60 over zero. Okay. That's pretty much gone, but you're barely alive. So they put some compression pants on me to get the blood up to my heart, got me in the bus, got me to the nearest community hospital, which was not equipped to handle trauma. But the surgeon on call that night was equipped to handle trauma. And she, they, the whole team spent the night just trying to stabilize me. And uh, it was seven weeks in ICU, four months in a hospital. And you know, you've been through many, many surgeries. Uh, I had six major surgeries, uh, two code blues. Uh, I was trying to, to leave again. I did not want to stay in this body on this planet anymore once i had been to the other side you had the code blues during the surgeries or just during the hospital stay uh during the surgeries do you remember um coding do you remember leaving your I, body I remember again? i i remember one of them i don't remember the other um and it was um Yeah, it was just so painful. It was just so painful. I had so much pain physically. And then emotionally, I had so much pain because the first thing I said when I woke up, okay, was don't tell my dad, he'll kill me because he will oh assume God. that I was drinking, I was smoking, and I was with this cadet. I broke his rules and therefore I broke God's rules and I deserved it. That's my dad's thinking of how life goes, you know, so I disobeyed him and I should have to pay the consequences. And he was extremely disappointed in me and my poor choices. And even when I told him recently, you know, last year about this call with my roommate and I had asked for a ride from her and, you know, he still, he still didn't forgive me. He still didn't say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. He said, you still made a bad decision and you should have walked home. And that's when I said, I will have nothing else to do with you because walking back home to the Academy at seven 30 at night in the dark, 25 miles, I, yeah. 
I mean, really, if a bear didn't right. get me, a person would have, you know, <laughs> so, um, you know, it's just, that's who he is. He can't admit that he was wrong or that, you know, he, anyway, that's, that's my parents. Yeah, and oh man, I'm sorry about that. That's tough. Yeah, they're religious really addicts tough. and, you know, they can't get their head around anything other than their belief systems regarding the Bible. And um, for me, I was just shattered, just shattered because I've been trying to make up for that my whole life. Those 20 years when my memory didn't come back, I tried so hard to achieve. I mean, I worked at the Centers for Disease Control, which in public health, I got a degree, you know, I got a master's degree, I became a dietitian, I did all these things. I was on CNN. I, I mean, I did a lot of things in my career, but it was never enough for him. And it wasn't good enough. And it wasn't enough to, to um, forgive me for ruining my opportunity at the academy. And so, you know, my soul knew I needed out of there. And honestly, when I look at it, this is the way I got out without being in shame right. because now yeah. um, it was a disabled, honorable veteran. Uh, I have now been compensated at 100% disability, permanent disability with the VA. And I can now understand and empathize with veterans and what they have to go through and right. uh, for medical care and just the whole part of that military. So, um, you know, when I put on my book up here, my initials, you know, just like you, you probably got a lot of the alphabet after your name. Um, but the most important one to me is BTDT. Been there, done that. Because yeah. That gives me empathy, sympathy, compassion, for your journey and, and what you've been. So I tell anybody, I said, just put it on your resume. You know? And if someone yeah. asks, that is more important than, there, all done the, that. Yeah, yeah, than all the theory that you learned, you know, all the information about nutrition that I learned. And I tried to tell people, okay, I'm still trying to tell you to eat your fruits and vegetables. But that message for 30 years has not moved the needle. People still only eat one and a half servings of fruit and vegetables. And so- right. <laughs> I'm just like, okay, I'm giving up on that. I'm going to go into the spiritual piece of healing and health. And to me, that's the most important, but we have to practice all the, the realms of healing. So Nicole, um, in between, in between those, those 19 years that it took for you to remember all that, what did you go through for those 19 years? Did you, did, I mean, I can, I can see and, and I can feel that there's some pain, still residual pain with your father. I can see that perhaps that's what happened in between those 19 years, trying to get his approval and, and his acceptance. But did you have any spiritual awakening between then or did that happen once you actually had your, got your memory back? That happened once I got my memory back. What happened was the extent of my injuries were so severe that I uh, went back home and my mother basically, I was in an infant state again. I couldn't walk. I couldn't go to the bathroom. I couldn't feed myself. So I was totally dependent on her again at age 19 when all my friends are off at Ole Miss and Mississippi State partying and fraternities and sororities. I'm at home trying to go to physical therapy, learn how to walk again, uh, learn how to just function, basic functions of daily living, you know? And once I did that, then my dad said, you're gonna go to school. I'm gonna put you out. Uh, you're gonna go live with your sister. And my sister didn't get a sister or a roommate. She got someone who was um, in a lot of pain and didn't know how to deal with it. And that is when my eating disorder started and I turned to food because I never got any mental health. My parents believed that God and Jesus would be my psychiatrist and they were wrong about that. You know, Jesus never sat down with me and counseled me about something, you know, it just, yeah. it, it didn't help to pray to these, to, to, to Jesus or to God that I had grown, the concepts of God that I'd grown up with. I never got any evidence or any feedback or any help. So I turned to food and back then compulsive eating was what it was called. And today it's now binge eating disorder. And it was trying to manage my pain and feeling so mangled and scarred. Um, I had to be emergency surgery where I coded, they cut me from top to bottom. And I'm going to school at you know Southern Methodist with 
all of these beautiful girls and guys and sororities and everything was based on looks and, and image. here you are and, with scars and pain and emotionally just all yeah, around not yeah. not where these people are at that sounds very very brutal and very difficult to go through so very lonely very disconnected from god uh i tried churches it didn't connect with me at all and i think by the time my memory did come back i had started going to a unity church and started getting more support i was in therapy uh, uh group therapy um, um what is it just going to body therapy chiropractic i mean i was using yoga i was doing all these other modalities to help support my body and my mind and my spirit and i think that is the reason that my body was able to remember the trauma this repressed memory came up is because i did have the support and i did have the resources Otherwise, I think I would have gone into a psychiatric unit if it all come back at one time, you know, and what I remember working with um, my doctor was when I got when I flew up into the air and my angel, my grandfather now came down and took me back up. I was at a level where this is my NDE experience. I went through this white light, which is just amazing and so comforting. And you just feel like you're wrapped in the arms of an angel. You're so protected. It is so peaceful. It is so um, brilliant beyond words, really. And I was, when I got up there, I was, of course, not in my body because I could look down and see my corpse sitting in the ditch. I could see what I was wearing. I could see I had no life. And when you look at a dead person, they have, without the life, they're a different person. When you really look at their body, they're not. Even when they try to make them up with the hairdo and the same like that, it's right. like, that doesn't look like my, my yeah. aunt or, you know, it just doesn't. And it's because it that life force energy has come out of them that made them who they are. And that's one of the first lessons from the near-death experiencers that I talk about in my book is we do not die. You know, our soul has many lives. This is not our first rodeo. But when I was over there, I could hear other conversations between angels and spirits. And, and they weren't speaking English. I don't know what they were speaking, but I was able to understand it. And there were two next to me that were talking about how we here on earth need to ask them for help. And these were angels. So uh, the lesson one is ask angels for help. Okay. And these are the, these are the 10 common lessons from near death experience. Well, that one wasn't in there, but I did put it in because I have 12 chapters and that was only <laughs> 10 lessons. That is one of my lessons is ask the angels, the angelic realm for help. They are there to help us, but because we have free will, they're not just going to intervene in our life unless they're asked or you know, as you're saying it's this, an emergency. As you're saying this, um, I've recently, literally recently, what I mean by recently, I mean like within the last month, I've been okay. I've been asking for angels help either with nutrition or with even, let's say, putting a good interview here to make sure I reach an audience, you know, the, the right audience of ears that need to hear this story. And before that, it's like, well, how, how do people know that they're supposed to ask angels? How do how are we supposed to know? Like, yeah. how, you know what I mean? Like, so yeah, I, they didn't teach that in Sunday school. <laughs> no, they don't. So it, it's it, it gets a little complicated sometimes um, navigating through life and even as a spiritual person. And now that I know that I can ask angels for help, I see doors opening for me. And it's it's really outrageously beautifully it beautifully comes together and the trust that I have for angels with angels is just it keeps growing and the, you telling me this I mean that's the number one thing ask the angels ask the angel realm for help now how do you know which angels to ask for what type of help you don't have to ask specific excuse me specific angels you can just say angels I need your help you know I'm having a hard time with xyz it can be as simple as a parking space. And I know people laugh about that, asking the angels for help with a parking space, but dead gummit, those parking spaces show up, you know? <laughs> you know, we all have a guardian angel, every yeah. single one of us. So I ask people to start with trying to get in touch with who your guardian angel is. 
you know, and ask at night before you go to bed for your guardian angel to give you some information about themselves, you know, and over time you start developing a relationship with that guardian angel. And some of us have two. And some of us have more than we, we have a collection of angels around us, you know, and I am one that now has a collection of angels that do have specific things that they help me with. But I have always had uh, my guardian angel and we all have a spirit guide. So we need to start developing that relationship. But you don't have to start there if you don't want. You can just ask that there are archangels. I think most of us get taught about Archangel Michael and Gabriel and uh, right. Uriel and Raphael. So you can ask the archangels and they each have a specific um, genre they work in. You know, Gabriel is more about communication. Um, so it, it, Raphael is more about health. So, you know, you can ask them specifically. So you can do it a number of ways and just ask. It's that simple, but we forget, we forget to ask. We get caught up in the crisis and we don't turn to them or God, our concept of God, unless it's an emergency, you know? And then what I have also learned is to pray for the highest and greatest good or something better than what I have thought, you know, instead of trying to be specific because I don't know what is so, for the highest and greatest good. How did you discover who your, who your angels were, who your guardian angel was? Um, it just came to me walking on the beach one day. I was did you ask at, out loud. Did you, did you have that intention or did it come out of nowhere? I have had the intention of wanting to develop the relationship. And then one day I kept hearing, I heard Serafina three different times. Now that's not a word you hear a lot, right? So yeah. And I was living in Hawaii at the time and I saw a beautiful rainbow and it's like, that's it. That's Serafina. She's my rainbow, you know, and I love colors. I, um, I should have been born. I mean, I should have lived in the sixties with all the beautiful colors. <laughs> flower power. I, I, yeah. Flower power. And, um, I love color. And that's what also is on the other side is colors that we never even seen or known. It's, they can't fill the hundred and what is it? 20 in the Crayola look color box <laughs> now but beautiful colors uh on the wow. other side that are just you know amazing and of course music but um so Serafina is the first that came and then uh James is my military angel and that may be an oxymoron but typically people that have been through trauma and near-death experiences have an angel that are there to protect them and he fought really hard to keep me alive because he knew what my message was going to be and he knew what my mission was going to be. And he uh, made sure I came back from the code blues and the other times that I just was so depressed that I couldn't understand why I was here because I was in such pain with a migraine or stomach issues, um, bowel issues or whatever it was, you know, and so how did you meet James and how did James become, how did you realize he was the one that helped you through the code blues and everything that I actually worked with a, uh, spirit, um, a woman who is a spirit, uh, channeler. And, um, I knew there was someone around me, but I wasn't, I couldn't, I couldn't get it. So this is why we need help sometimes and asking yeah. other people that do have these gifts Mm -hmm. and talents and abilities to work with them and shamans help with the soul part of healing because if you have a fragmented soul you need to pull those fragmented parts back into you and so you're whole otherwise you keep your soul keeps getting bombarded with these triggers and you have no way to to defend yourself so to speak so it's self-protection and once you get those pieces back in place, then you can get into alignment more with the, um, the angelic, the spiritual realm, you know, but as long as you're fragmented, you're staying triggered in the trauma response loop and, yeah. uh, and staying worried and all these in fear, these lower vibrations. And so, you know, my main message after I talked to the, heard the conversation with the two angels, I was told that I was to go back and tell people not to be afraid of death. 
And so when your podcast came up a little less fear, <laughs> I was like, oh my God, this is exactly the message is to fear, to not fear death. Because when you are in fear, you lose clarity. Okay. So oh, yeah. if you think about that, you're operating from this back part of your brain, your amygdala, your fight, flight, or freeze, instead of your prefrontal cortex, which is making all your um, executive reasoning decisions, right? So this part just hijacks it. I mean, you don't get a part, you don't get to think about it. It just hijacks it because we're going to go into survival mode. So you can't get the clarity that you would get out of this prefrontal cortex, right? Right. So the worst thing to do is to be making decisions out of fear. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And there are so many unconscious fears that we have. I mean, look at the world right now, just the mass shootings. It's parents are fearful to send their kids to school. You know, you never know what's going to happen. The, the whole pandemic. I mean, there has been a lot of fear put out into the world. And so our bodies have been creating this thing, states of anxiety and depression and PTSD and dysregulated nervous systems. You know, we're all suffering, I think at some level with, with all of that, you know? Uh, and in order to regain your clarity, you've got to address your fears. Um, and your, most people's fears are irrational. Okay. Oh, yeah. They just, they're, they right. don't make sense. They're not true. And they come from this existence of limiting beliefs. And so this is without those limiting beliefs, you know, your world will exist in a state of alignment your body, soul, mind, um, spirit. And so the alignment of that is the goal. And so we can reach that level of clarity. So that's the process is to get an alignment, but you have to become aware that you do have fears. And in my book, I talk about a list of different, it's a checklist really on fears that you may experience when you think about your own death. And the first one is, I will worry what will happen to me after death. Mm -hmm. um, people that have a very strong religious upbringing, like I did, we were taught that you will go to a place called hell if you don't follow oh, yeah. certain, certain rules. Right. The so, good trips. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And the Catholics. And I mean, they put I it grew, on everybody. I grew up Catholic. Yeah. Everything's so simple. You, yeah. So everything is fear-based and you run on this fear your whole life because that is the ultimate right we're all going to yeah. die and we all want to be with our families on the other side and so the worst thing you could do is to separate yourself and be bad and go to hell and so you have got to really understand and look at what your concept of God really is, because that is going to define what your fears are regarding death. You know, it's interesting, as you're saying this, I'm remembering um, when I was attending Buddhist classes, we would do a meditation on our own death. And a lot of people didn't like this. And I have to tell you, the first time I did it, I didn't like it. Yeah. yeah no. <laughs> you had to close your eyes, envision yourself taking your last breath. And all of this was for you to have a relationship with death and to accept death and, and to know that it's a natural process for everybody. But it's not an easy thing to do. And it's not an easy thing for many, not anybody to really do. No, but it's part of what we need to do to prepare ourselves for death. And it's so important to do that because that releases fears, okay, yes. that we didn't even know that we had. And exactly. the truth, the truth is any of us can die at any moment. None of us yeah. are guaranteed tomorrow. And we forget that. We forget that we could, we, something can happen tomorrow. I mean, I'm sure this is when we're taping, this is around the, the mass murder of the University of Michigan students. Okay, three died, five are in the hospital. And I'm sure those two 19 year olds and 18 year or 20 year old kids, they never thought that they weren't gonna wake up or that someone would come in their classroom and kill them. And uh, I certainly at 19 didn't think I was gonna be in a drunk driving crash and die. Uh, that was the furthest thing from my mind. But at that time, I still believed in a God that was punishing and 
punitive and the wrath of God would come on me. So I died in a state of fear about death. And that is why I have now come back around and realized that death is nothing to fear. Death, you know, and most of the books written about death, it's cloaked death, it's cloaked in this veil of doom and gloom and depression and negativity. Yeah. And my mission is uh, to help change the worldview and vibration and cultural misunderstanding surrounding death. And to do this, we have to start addressing the difficulties getting there, which are our fears. Because not only me, but hundreds of thousands of others have experienced, 100% of us have experienced death as beauty, light, and loving kindness on the other side. You know, there's no negativity. And that's what I love about these 10 common lessons. They're all positive about death. And that's what we need to start focusing on is that it is a positive experience. We are not judged. We are not alone. All of these things that we fear. And when we die, people think, oh, I like COVID. I wasn't there with her when she died or they passed away. And you feel bad and you feel guilty. And I say, is that a, more on you or the person that died? Because when we do die, the angels, the deceased loved ones, even our pets come in and surround us. So they may not be humans there, but the spirit guides are there and the person that is passing can see them and they start reaching out to them. You know, you'll see people do that and they'll pass in and out of that, flipping to the other side, flipping back to this side before they pass, you know, and it's actually, um, they're preparing you know, these people, they're starting mm -hmm. to see all these, these um, divine beings coming in to assist. It's beautiful. Nicole, Nicole, I'd like to go over some your 10 common lessons from near death experience. But before we go into that, I have a question. Um, now that you've have your regained your memory back from the accident and everything, how do you see fate and destiny? How do you view that? Um, I believe we all come here with a purpose. Okay. And a lesson to learn. We incarnate with this contract, so to speak. Uh, and I think as soon as we learn that, we move on. And that may happen at age four, it may happen at age 24 or 90 or whatever that is. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that there is, you know, free will, which is really the hardest thing to come to understand is our choice in the decisions affect others. So the guy's choice to drink and drive and to try to make a sexual pass at me and not respect mm -hmm. my decision, that caused him to wreck the car. And the consequence for me was uh, death there and then coming back. So but was that, do you feel though that that was meant to happen? Were you meant to get into that accident? I think for me, it was my way out of the academy because I was getting more depressed being there. It was getting harder for me to be there. The academics were not in alignment with who I am. I'm not an engineer. I'm not a physicist. Uh, I like more nutrition and that kind of uh, anatomy, physiology. And that whole, their whole curriculum is geared to, you know, aerospace engineering and things like that, which is mm -hmm. not, not who I am. So mm -hmm. the fear of failure just kept that fear kept running in me. And I was like, oh my gosh, I just can't fail out of here. I don't want to be a failure. So you live with that fear day in and day out, and it changes your body's chemical response. You know, you're living in fight, flight, or fear all the time. If you live in a in an abusive household, you're gonna be living with that your entire life. So in order to turn that alarm system off uh, and trust yourself, trust um, the higher realm has your back mm -hmm. and they're here to help us. 
that involves you having to get in touch with yourself. And most of us have a term called spiritual amnesia. We have forgotten who we really are at the soul level, the light, the love, the beauty. We are focused now on differences, on fear, all these um, hatred, you know, it, it, lower vibrations that yes. don't allow us to evolve as a uh, um, as a, as a oneness. And that's, a, and that is a, another one of the lessons is that everything and everyone is connected because we're all energy. Yes, absolutely. For people I mean, that are tuning in for the first time, how could you explain um, vibration? Vibration is an energy state of being, and it is a feeling I don't know if you ever experienced it, but it's kind of like you get angel bumps or goosebumps all over you that yeah. you know that something is connecting with you and it's integrating with you mm. and it feels like solid. Aligned. I get chills when I get that connection. Like it's yes. almost like a, like a change in temperature and so, or sometimes I yes. can sweat a lot. It's really interesting. Yes. So different people will have different reactions when they feel that. And um, it is a ability from that to start transcending these lower vibrations so you're rising instead of hating people you look at the good in them and try to find something loving about them they don't have to be your friend but you don't have to run around with a sticker that i saw today that said my dog hates biden you know i looked at that and i'm like your dog your, your poor dog, it, 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 that is the most loving thing in the world, right? And you're putting that on the back of your, your truck. You know, it's just that kind of mindset, mentality, toxicity, where you're not conscious. And this is what exactly. I think this period in time is about, is awakening to who you really are as a spirit and a soul. And I love how you said that you said not they're not conscious because I often feel um, I find myself being a very joyful person and full of love. And when I meet people that are very negative and um, just low vibration, I feel that they're not conscious. And it's like yes. when I talk to them, I can feel that I'm not really talking to them. I'm talking to their traumas. I'm talking to their all these shields, all these walls. And, it, and it's almost impossible to penetrate them with happiness at that point. Yes, you can't. It's impossible because yeah. you have to do the work on yourself of transformation. And right. that is what my book is, is transforming myself to fully live. It went from a near death experience to a spiritually transformative experience. And, you know, I want to just read a short, short clip on what a concept of God might look like for your readers. Uh, and yes. this is from a six-year-old. And wow. you know, as a doctor, um, <laughs> that at age six, that's when you start individuating, okay? You're going to get on that school yeah. bus by yourself. You don't need mommy holding your hand, right? right? So here's this little girl who came to me from a fundamental background, and she's scared she's going to hell, and she's going to be separated from her family. Now, she's already been adopted, and so she's already been separated from her first family. And she's very anxious. She goes into her parents' bedroom every night to sleep. And when I asked her how she sees God, she eagerly told me, God is a blue spirit with colors and balloons in all different colors, no head and can talk. So clearly this little girl is still having a direct experience with God, no filters involved from other people. And that's what I love about children is they still, they are the closest to the other side because they haven't built up all these filters right. and belief systems that are no longer true. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, when I went to the other side, God was, God was this energy. God is love, period, and descendants. There's no judgmentalism. Mm -hmm. There's no punishing. There's no any of that. That just keeps people in fear and allows churches that promote that to control people in that fear that they're not doing enough or they're bad or they've, you know, they've sinned, you know, and I am just 
trying to enlighten people that that's not what God is. That is a man-made concept that was been around for generations and most wars are started in the name of God. And that's not the truth. God right. is love. He, you know, love really is all that matters. That's why I put hearts on the cover of my book and is the source of all that exists. So if you think of the source being what created all of this, that God, whatever you want to call it, mm. then if love is all that matters, God is love. And mm. God is not external. It's not outside of us. That's the other belief system I was raised with that I had to go through Jesus or I had to go through somebody else or do something in order to get to God. You know, mm -hmm. God is already within. We are mm -hmm. all sparks of eternal life. And the Buddhist uh, other, you know, the namaste is the God in me meets the God in you. And it, it is there. I love that. So tell us about your 10 common lessons from NDEs. <laughs> I've been wanting to Okay. <laughs> so the first one is we don't die. Okay. So we covered that. Our soul lives on. It has many incarnations. Love is all that matters and is the source of all that exists. Okay. So, uh, you know, people are starting to get that message, but you have to love yourself first and you're not going to meet another human who's going to unconditionally love you. You're going to be conditions because we are human. We're human and we're spirit. And we have to learn that we have to balance those two worlds. Right. Everything and everyone is connected. Okay, we're connected to the animals, we're connected to Mother Earth, the way we treat Mother Earth, the way we treat the animals, the way we treat each other is we're all connected and we need to be respectful of each other. And we have not gotten there yet. No. Loving ourselves and others is the most important thing that we can do. Because if you love yourself, that love is going to transfer and you will see it and be able to, you know, like I can see it in you, you know, like you said, mm -hmm. I like to be in a state of joy and love. And, and you just have an aura and a presence where I'm not about fighting. I'm not about right. arguing. <laughs> I'm not about conflict. You know, don't set that up towards me because that's not what my spirit wants or needs or who I am. Exactly. Um, we are more than our physical body and brain. Okay, so I talked about that with the corpse, you know, it's just, mm -hmm. you know, that, 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 uh, that life force is what gives us the vitality of who we really are. We are never alone. The angels, the spiritual realm, they are always with us. God is always within us. We are never judged. How amazing is that? That is and amazing. We, but we have to start with ourselves. Because we judge ourselves, most of us, the harshest. Mm -hmm. And then it comes from parents because those are our role models. And whatever they, their values were, we feel judged by them, that we disappointed them. We didn't get it right. We didn't do this, that, or the other. Okay. And then it can be other authority figures, but we are conditioned into a society that does judge, judges on sex, judges on uh, religion judges on um, uh, gender uh, judges on judges on uh, everything yeah yeah and uh, you know even judges on memory of did I remember right you know 2019 years later so Goodness. no judgment but we have to start with loving ourselves instead of judging ourselves take out the word should out of your vocabulary period okay yeah. no shooting anybody because yeah. when when i like if i you should do this you should ask blah 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 you just shame that person that's true there's a lot of shame in that word should yeah so yeah get it out watch become aware when you say that and go oh what other word can i substitute for that because you think you know better than that person yeah. Oh, no. We're all equal for sure. Yeah. Okay. Our true selves are perfect and we are loved more than we can fathom. That is the soul part. It's perfect. There's nothing wrong. 
we are all imperfect on the human side, but on the spiritual side, we are all perfect. I love it. Is that the 10th one? No, that is eight, nine. Okay. We will see, we will see loved ones and others when we return home. Okay, so your soul goes home. That's like me seeing my grandfather. You will see yeah. others. And 10, during a life review, we learn how everything we said, did, and thought during our physical life impacted ourselves, others, and the world. That's amazing. And you got these 10 common lessons um, from other people that you've spoken to, other people that you've met, or books that you've read. How did no, you get I, all of these? I, it's actually a research document because... Um, you know, part of me goes to that research part. International Association of Near-Death Studies compiled this in their annual 2020 report. It's right in that report. That's incredible. Nicole, tell us about your book. Well, my book came out in August and I'm delighted to say it's Congratulations. already, a, it's already <laughs> a bestseller and it is my journey, okay, um, to how to not fear death and to live fully. So I don't spend a whole lot of time talking about the other side because there's plenty of books out there that talk about what's over on the other side. I talk about these lessons. I talk about my experience growing up and the, the fear that has been instilled with me growing up. Um, if I didn't do what I was told, getting beat as a kid, you know, just, just how the fear has run my life and how that has set me up to be a people pleaser. And that identity and other identities that we over identify with actually are killers. Absolutely. And also the realm of emotions. Most of us are very illiterate in this country about emotions. We learn four, bad, mad, sad, and glad. Okay. And there is a buffet of them and we need <laughs> to learn to express them and not stuff them down with uh, food, liquor, whatever it is, we have to express and embody our emotions, not yes. cut it off right here and think. And I was a thinker. Oh yeah. I think I'm mad at him. That's the right emotion. No, I need to embody it. And so yeah. you have to get this channel of your voice opened up to be able to embody yeah, it. The throat that's, chakra. that's right. And speaking your truth. And that's not easy for a lot of us because we feel like if we really speak our truth, we may lose the relationship. We may lose whatever. We're going to lose something if we really put it out there. Uh, I would encourage you to really look at that and see why you are scared of losing that, you know, because mm -hmm. if you can't speak your truth, then you're not being authentic and being honest and being able to be the, the true person that you are. And um, yeah. The book is more about that journey and the process and some tools that I found along the way, your emotional technique. Um, you know, yes, um, there's not going to be one modality that's going to, quote, fix you. And I was always looking for that. And that healing is not linear. Okay. It doesn't go. It's cheap. Mm -mm. It's like a roller coaster. It, <laughs> it really is. A roller is. Coaster. And we're all. Our health is extremely important, and we realize that when it's taken away from us, and we're we don't, you know, we're even having a toothache. You start focusing on the pain, right? Mm -hmm. So it's about how to live fully. And if you're in any kind of fear, especially about death, you're you're not going to live fully. You're going to be sure. keeping yourself back. And I, I don't want that. I did that for most of my life. I lived alone for 20 years. I didn't get married till I was 40. I talk about that in the book. Um, and I thought I could control my life easier that way because I was so out of control with the car crash that the eating, de eating disorder developed. And I, that lasted for 20 years until mm -hmm. I got married. So there's a lot of personal information in there that I share from my heart because I want people to be this is why I am here is to help people with this. And I hope my book does do that. You know, it is to help well, with you it being the bestseller. It's already doing that. <laughs> well, it's what is the title of your book? It's called you are deathless A near death experience taught me how to fully live and to not fear death. And you it's on... are deathless. That's an incredible title. <laughs> Thank you. It's so true. How can our viewers, our watchers, and our listeners find you, Nicole? If they need to get a, if they need to get a touch, in touch with you. 
Well, I have a website, www.nicolekerr.com. I can send you the first chapter for free. And, you know, I wrote this book to help people with their fears about death and support you through the loss of loved ones. And I hope my book will inspire you to live fully and freely with your heart and your hands wide open. But you can also get me on Facebook, uh, Nicole A. Kerr. You can get me on Instagram, Nicole Angelique. There's Angel in that Angelique. And uh, I'm also on LinkedIn uh, as Nicole Kerr as well. And then Goodreads. So the book is available on Amazon. Uh, I am doing the audio recordings of the book now because I realize 30% of you do not want to read or don't like to read or are unable to read. So I am uh, moving through that and that should be available spring of this year in the aud audible form that, but it is available on Kindle and a hardcover and a soft cover. And it's $9 and 99 cents right now on sale. And I think it will help I think you will identify a lot of people with a lot of different parts of the book. And I hope it inspires you to keep pursuing this area of death and find the positivity in it and preparing yourself for it. So whether you die suddenly or whether you get a terminal diagnosis that you're prepared for death. I love this, Nicole. Nicole Kerr, everybody. Nicole at Kerr as in K-E-R-R. What an amazing interview this has been. Your positivity, I mean, your vibr your high vibration. You've just inspired <laughs> me to keep going and and not fear death at all. I actually don't fear death. I don't. I'm not afraid of it at all. I'm um, I'm not saying I'm welcoming it right now, but no, <laughs> no, but I, I, you know, but I, but I'm not afraid of it because yeah. I'm I'm very much um in tune and aligned with with love, and I feel the love around me, and I feel the love with you. So thank you so much for sharing your love on the Little Aww. Less Fear podcast, and I look forward to keeping in touch with you. I'm about to find you on Instagram so we can, we can uh, stay connected. Well, thank you so very much. It's been my absolute pleasure and um, just everyone be well and just, you know, uh, I just continue to pray for peace for the whole planet. Absolutely. Very well yeah. said. Thank you so much, Nicole. You're welcome.